Hello, and welcome back to the Wacom Manga and Anime Days 2021. Thank you for joining us for the last session on the last day of this three-day online event dedicated to all things manga, anime, and even cooking. My name is Jeroen, and I'm happy to guide you through the introduction for the last time. But I promise you, we have a real highlight to finish this event, because with us are Saturday AM, and they will explore the indie manga market with us. But before we jump into the talk, let me share some of the basic housekeeping rules with you. This session will approximately last for one hour with a dedicated Q&A session at the end. We will, keep a, we'll, we will be keeping an eye on the chat, so feel free to send your questions anytime you wish. But please be kind to each other and do not spam the chat. As you know, this YouTube live stream was running for the last three days, but we will close it shortly after the event. However, this talk, like most other talks, is being recorded and will be shared on the Wacom YouTube channel next week. Now, let me continue with a brief introduction of who we are. Wacom has been around for almost 40 years and we are pioneers of digital pen input technology. From creative pen tablets and interactive displays to mobile pen computers, we offer creatives powerful tools to express their ideas. But we would not be here without our partners Pixiv and Clip Studio Paint. Clip Studio Paint is a versatile graphic software best suited for drawing and painting to create a wider range of content. With a wealth of unique features, it helps to create anything from illustration over comics to concept art and even animation. No matter if professional or hobbyist, Clip Studio Paint's natural drawing feel is loved by artists around the world. Pixiv is a social network platform for artists that focuses on communication through their artworks. It was launched in September 2007 and specializes in artwork publication and communication based on the concept of make creativity more enjoyable. They have now over 50 million users and going strong. You can visit and join the amazing community of Pixiv at pixiv.net forward slash en. One more thing before we start. If you are based in the EU or UK, we have an amazing offer for you all. Please visit our Wacom eStore and use the discount code MANGA20 for a discount of up to 20% on a wide range of Wacom products, including Wacom One and Wacom Cintiq pen displays and Intuos and Intuos Pro pen tablets. For those of you who are outside of Europe, please check out uh, your local Wacom eStore or dealers for ongoing promotions. All right, time to start. And we are super excited to have White, Jodin, and Frederick here from Saturday AM. Saturday AM is the world's most diverse manga inspired brand with exclusive comics published first via digital magazine Saturday AM for Shonen, Saturday PM for Seinen, and Saturday Brunch for Jose. White Manga is from Nigeria, the creator of the hit indie manga Apple Black, and is a YouTuber with over 400,000, 400, the K, sorry, 400,000 followers, obviously. Jay Odin is one of our most accomplished artists with a portfolio including Oni Press, USA Today, Antarctic Press, as well as, as his creator owned series with Saturday AM called Hammer. So without further ado, let's bring them on and start the session. Enjoy. Well, hey, everybody. Um, my name is Frederick, and I am the founder publisher of Say AM. And it is a pleasure to speak with you all here at Wacom's Manga and Anime Days. Um, on behalf of Saturday AM, we're extremely honored to have a chance to talk about our love of this medium and of the comic uh, production process that we go through in producing our brand. So uh, with that being said, we have a small presentation here that we'll go through. Um, it's a PowerPoint, it's not particularly fancy, uh, but hopefully you'll have a chance to learn a little bit from us. Uh, we'll be bringing in uh, two of our incredible artists, uh, White Manga, uh, as Jerome indicated, is uh, uh, one of the top artists in the indie manga space, and we're uh, really excited and honored to have him here today. He's also a co-founder in the company, so he's someone that has a really intimate view of what we've gone through to build Saturday AM. Likewise, Jay Odin is uh, one of just our absolute uh, most popular uh, artists. He's one of the most accomplished artists with a portfolio that consists of some of the top independent comic book companies uh, in America. And, uh, and we're just honored to uh, be able to address all of you 
because we love what we do here at Saturday a and So with that being said, let's begin the process, of course. You can see uh, these are all of us here. Um, we, uh, we're handsome people. Uh, so, you know, you can appreciate the comic art here. Jay cheated and tried to squeeze in his live face there. So um, that tells you it's what a person Jay is. You can follow White Manga and Jay Oden both across all social media uh, at their uh, social media handles, White Manga, spelled W-H-Y-T-M-A-N-G-A for, uh, for all of his uh, social media. And Jay Oden is J-A-Y-O-D-I-N. And uh, we do implore you guys to please uh, follow these guys. And um, you probably uh, find some really great things about creating artwork from them uh, uh, when they're not talking about Saturday Asian. Let's start off with the basics. We are the world's most diverse manga uh, and, uh, and uh, manga brand. Uh, and we exist to discover, develop, and distribute exciting creators from around the world. Uh, we are very committed to the idea of taking manga into a new direction. And that means by, you know, transplanting it from just being a Japanese uh, 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 centric uh, art form to being something that much like the, the consumer part of it where people around the world love this extraordinary product. We wanna make sure that they feel like they have a home with it. And we felt that uh, the uh, efforts that we put forth in trying to create new manga starts with bringing a lot of you into the mix by having you be able to create content in the manga art style. Uh, let's see here, uh, okay. Uh, there's a couple of basic things that we all know. Marvel probably has like the biggest sort of like brand uh, around the world, especially with the Marvel movies right now. In fact, the Marvel movies are the most successful film franchise in history and the most successful comic book adaptations in history. In fact, the Marvel Cinematic Universe across 23 movies has already generated over $22 billion. So you can do the math, folks. That's almost a billion dollars per franchise. That doesn't count the toys, the t-shirts, the coloring books, the, you know, everything that would go with uh, Marvel. That's how massive Marvel is. But to put it in, in additional context, uh, manga sales in Japan alone, uh, top, 600, top 600 billion dollar, 600 billion yen, sorry, in 2020 for the first time ever. So while Marvel as a brand is just massive, manga as an art form, as an industry, it's the most successful comic book industry on the planet. And America, of course, is home of Marvel. France has some extraordinarily popular uh, European comic creators, but nobody has a bigger industry than, Jap than Japan with their manga product. Um, American or Western comics exist really in two forms. You've got the single story, which they call floppies. So you have your DC, your Marvel comics, you, know, you get the single issue of a Spider-Man or a Batman, and it's going to cost you anywhere between three and five dollars. I'm old enough to remember when they cost like 25 to 50 cent, but regardless, uh, you get about 25 to 40 pages. They are in color, uh, but you know, but, but that's, you know, it, for lovers of manga, you can see already, that's a very different media. Uh, conversely, the second form of it is graphic novels, like this Invincible Compendium, and these can be much more expensive. You can do up to about 25 bucks or even more, uh, but they tend to be about 10 bucks or so in between 10 and 25, and you get about four to six issues of that respective series, whether it's Spider-Man or X-Men or Justice League, into a single package. In Japan, it's very different. Um, first of all, manga is released in these kind of phone book size uh, products that uh, can be, you know, merchandise nearly anywhere, but typically in convenience stores like 7-Eleven. And they cost about the same cost as an American comic book. Now, they are not in color. They certainly don't have full color comics. They might have color ads and so forth, but, and the paper tends to be a lot cheaper. But you get several stories inside of that comic book. You get several, several stories. You get about between 10 to 20 stories. After a time period, their graphic novel format are called Tankabons, and those retail for, again, pretty inexpensive, between four and seven bucks. Some can cost more depending on the size, but those are typically the cost of it. So you can see here, uh, weekly Shonen Jump cover, a V-Jump cover, and then the cover of the, the Japanese version of a really hot series right now called Tokyo Revengers. So... Manga sales are dominant in the U.S. This is a really, really big category. In fact, it is just, it is just really swamping and just uh, overtaking everything 
from all the other companies. In fact, you can see here, this is just an old uh, NPD report uh, publicly available that you can see here that, that My Hero Academia alone is beating most of the Marvel and DC comic titles on a regular basis. So the fact of the matter is that manga is incredibly popular around the world, whether it's here in America, whether it's in Europe, parts of Asia, Africa, Latin America, manga is becoming one of the most dominant popular art forms for young creators around the world. We here at Saturday M absolutely love Japanese manga, but we also love our diversity. We believe the world that we see and live in that all of us are a part of should also reflect the manga product that we hope to enjoy. You can look at some of the most popular series in manga and while they would argue there's some diversity there, certainly the diversity does not extend to the sort of people who look like myself, white or Jay or others. Uh, you don't see a lot of representation from Indian uh, or Southeast Asian individuals, certainly if not from Latin American individuals, um, Arabic, Jewish. Uh, there's just a lot of folks who uh, appreciate manga, even though manga doesn't necessarily represent their, uh, their uh, cultural ideas and or their character relations. Uh, white characters, however, are pretty well established in manga. And so when we hear the term diverse, that manga is already diverse, that's always a smack in the face to us because that's not true. Manga is diverse if you look white or if you are Asian. It is not diverse if you represent any of the countless other groups. And we decided to change that. We believe in diverse manga. We believe that this fantastic art form with character designs that just are amazing, with stories that are fast and thrilling and have constant thrills and, and twists and turns. We believe that that incredible art form deserves to have content and characters that look like the rest of the world as well. We don't think that the story stop just because the character may not be Japanese or European. We think that the stories can be just as exciting if the character is from a different country or a different ethnicity or a different gender or a different orientation. And obviously the BL movement and Yuri and Yoli uh, manga in Japan continue to uh, push uh, great representation for uh, our brothers and sisters in the LGBTQ movement. But we wanna see more of that for everybody else. And so we decided to create and really explore diverse manga. We attract and cater to artists from literally around the world. We have fans and we have artists who hail from six continents. There's only seven continents, folks, and one of them really nobody lives on. So that's how extraordinarily popular Saturday AM has uncovered and has been able to uh, achieve based on the fact that there really was an appetite and really is an appetite to see more diverse manga. So we decided to go in a route that really honored the art form that we love so much. So when you look at Japan's manga uh, category, uh, they break it down into different genres or categories, I guess is the right way to put it. You have Jose, which speaks to older female readers. You have Saini, which speaks to older male readers. You have Shonen and Shoujo, which speak to younger male and or female readers, depending on Shonen for boys and Shoujo for girls. And there's, there's still some other uh, categories. But for the most part, those are the three or four most dominant. And we felt really strongly about the things that we talked about earlier. We look at American comic books as much as we love American comic books as well. We really like the idea of, of, of extraordinary creators who are, from, who are coming from different parts of the world being all a part of the same experience. When you pick up a copy of a Saturday AM, a Saturday PM or a Saturday brunch, you're gonna to get to explore multiple series within those respective magazines. You're gonna get a chance to see several creators inside of each of those magazines. So Saturday PM here is actually representative of Saini, which is, uh, again, for older male readers. Saturday Brunch speaks to female and or, for us, LGBTQ readers. And then Saturday AM, of course, is our flagship and speaks to younger readers. And all of these uh, magazines are appropriate for men or women, gay or straight, any ethnicity. <laughs> but we do put a focus so that we can uh, easily define the content for our fans. Just to give you a breakdown of what each individual issue looks like, here's a, one of our most recent issues, issue 130, and you can see here that you know, we take great pride in our design. We have an incredible design team uh, with some fantastic people like Mitch Proctor and 
Joshua Thomas and Dakota, uh, and Dakota, I'm forgetting Dakota's last name, but we have some extraordinary designers who uh, help us put together just a fantastic magazine. And you can see here that the content just gives us a chance to talk. We do articles, uh, we set up the comics that we put inside. We have ads with some of our partners like Clip Studio Paint. Saturday PM, the articles uh, tend to be a bit more uh, adult. We tend to focus on a bit more uh, older or complex ideas. Uh, one of the most recent articles we did focused on the plight of LGBTQ artists in Brazil under uh, the Bolsonaro regime. And with Saturday brunch, because we do have such a fantastic group of female, male, and um, uh, LGBTQ creators within that magazine, then we tend to focus a lot on publications and projects that really speak to uh, our creators around the world and the various things that creators of color and creators of uh, they call BIPOC uh, deal with. So we're really excited about um, the uh, various magazines and things that you can get all these magazines at a very reasonable price because we put them all in our mag in our app that we have because the idea being for us is just like we talked about earlier between the American comic books and the Japanese comic books. The Japanese comic books what I love about them and I love about that entire delivery of their art form is that it's there to attract readers. So yes, they cut back on production values, they cut back on certain things, but at the end of the day, it's affordable. And it's much easier to get into the art form, to discover these great creators, to discover these great series when it's affordable. So we've done the same thing and warehoused everything within an app. And the app allows us to do a number of things. Uh, chiefly, it allows us to have all of our magazines available for readers, uh, many of them for free. In fact, all of our new uh, issues of our magazines are free. But then we also have a very efficient way to follow up on previous issues of the magazine or individual uh, series you might love like Apple Black and others that you can explore from the beginning, uh, just like you would via uh, a take a bond or a graphic novel. So we're really excited uh, about uh, our process with it. And we focused on digital when we launched back in 2013, before a lot of technology had shifted to, to uh, have uh, opportunities for a lot of independent creators or brands. Because we understood uh, coming from the video game industry like, I, like I, I, I did, I understood that physical inventory is really hard. Now we love physical product. We have graphic novels and other things. We love physical product, but we understood that getting our product, getting the chance to take new creators uh, like, like the folks you're gonna meet tonight and, and, and some of the other folks that are part of our group, getting a chance to put them in front of people around the world was the most important thing. And we just really wanted to eliminate barriers. So when you got to deal with printing books or shipping books and so forth, again, very much on our agenda, you guys are gonna hear about books from us in the near future and we have done books in the past, but the digital solution for us and for many young creators is so, so powerful to reach people because you eliminate barriers, you eliminate distance, and you're able to really get to folks in a fast way. And that's what our app was all about. It took us a couple of years to develop the app, but we still had, even then, in 2013, we had a complicated digital strategy that still worked for our consumers to discover us, to uh, have a chance to engage with us, and to uh, share what we were doing. So, the Saturday and brand has gone on to include lots of things. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But one thing that we take very seriously is our commitment to up and coming creators. The fact of the matter is, is that it's one thing to make our product accessible to fans by having a low cost application and to make our product digital. But at the same time, having great partners who understand that the only way for all of us to grow whether you make markers or pens, whether you make paper or sketchbooks, whether you make applications like Clip Studio Paint or technology like Wacom, is for us to make sure that we're always servicing up and coming artists with products, deals, outreach that speak to the diverse collection of up and coming artists out there. Having affordable products, reaching those creators where they are, these are the things that we care about greatly. And so when we partner with groups like Clip Studio Paint, Spectrum Nora, Sakura, Wacom, and more, or companies that have been, that we've partnered with in the UK, South Africa, Germany, and beyond, when we partner with groups, it is always important to us that those groups share our belief in growing new, talented, diverse creators. 
we would not be partnered with them if we didn't believe that they possess that. And that's why we're so honored that despite the fact that we built a brand that's trying to take manga in a new direction by making it more diverse, we count amongst the partners that we have three of the largest Japanese manga production companies. Clip Studio Paint, which is uh, created by the company Celsus, of course, is a product that's used by comic creators around the world. It's a Japanese company. Wacom, of course, produces some of the world's best tablets for up and coming artists in America and Brazil, all over the place, whether it's in advertising, graphic design, or in comics, or in animation. And we've been fortunate and very happy to partner with them. And then, of course, Sakura, makers of some of the finest art supply products, pens, markers, and the like. The Micron pen is a standard for any uh, serious artist. And we've been very honored to have a chance to speak and to work with all three companies. That's a hell of a thing to say for a company, again, of people who are not Japanese, who do not, be, do not feature regularly in manga, but love Japanese manga and, and want to see it continue to thrive by having an approach towards more diversity. So our commitment to tools, our commitment to product is really important. This has allowed us to grow to where we are today. So we want to talk about our series. We want to talk to the creators that we have and to explore what they went through in creating these series. We're going to start off with uh, probably our biggest series and probably the biggest independent manga that's out there, and that is the one and only Apple Black by White Manga. So, White, are you uh, you able to chat real quickly? Yes. Um, uh, first off, agree to everything you said. Uh, shout outs to uh, Wacom for this uh, this event, and um, yeah, we can we can chat. I am Odunze Ogugua, known as uh, White Manga, everywhere online as uh, the creator of Apple Black and uh, Bakasi published and serialized in Saturday AM and PM, respectively. Uh, here we have Apple Black, and essentially is a story that follows this character, Sano, who kind of struggles between uh, the burden on him being this Trinity savior in this world that's supposed to battle uh, an incoming doom known as the Infinite Night, while struggling with the disappearance of his father, who is the inventor uh, and scientists behind the immense power that is Apple Black and how these two sides of the story kind of um, combine. And uh, he struggles with also certain visions that seem to be geared towards turning him into uh, an agent of vengeance to uh, find those responsible for his father's demise. And so there is that internal struggle within the character and try to have fun with that. It's a fun shown in action series uh that deals with um sorcery and uh, interesting new ways that i try to tackle it and also try to include a lot of the cultures and just over my overall inspirant uh influences just in life as well as research with different cultures different kinds of people and interesting ways to tackle the idea of sorcery with wands and all of that. So it's a fun action series that uh, anybody can enjoy. Uh, how I started putting all of this together was actually during my college days. And so there was a huge struggle with uh, time management, trying to do all of that and also be in school. I think I, I did a computer science minor. I was an, a fine art major. It was actually flipped in the beginning, but over time, knowing that this is what I wanted to do, it just slowly was uh, making those gradual changes and learning everything I needed to learn to kind of get to this point and making use of the advantage that creators have today that less so back in the day, which is this digital age and the internet and using that to get your put, put yourself out there uh, and just be consistent, do a lot of work uh, until you kind of fall in front of the right eyes, basically preparing yourself for when the luck comes. And that's when I decided to, I saw a lot of other creators um, doing similar things and promoting their work. You know, it was always difficult to break into the industry. That was kind of a thing. And I think the internet, the internet was a way to, like Fred said, break some of these ba uh, barriers and uh, past the gatekeepers and kind of make your own path. And so let's talk about that real quickly, if you can, because I actually want to focus on, you know, some of the amazing things that you've done. So you you are, you know, within Saturday AM, you are one of the masters of social media. Like, you know, you really understand how to get the most out of Instagram and 
YouTube in particular and things like that. Mm -hmm. You currently hold over 400,000 subscribers to your channel. You just had a video that came out today, as a matter of fact. Uh, talk to me and talk to the, the, the readers about what you or the fans are, but what you um, like, what your understanding is, because obviously when you came into this, you, you were very young. When I met you, you were very young. So like, it's not like you knew this stuff, but you started to understand quickly how to put these things together. You were part of YouTube at the very beginning. So talk a little bit about like what you've seen and, and how artists can get the most out of using social media. Um, little tricks here was first things first is you kind of have to treat all of them separately and differently. They all work differently. They all have their own al algorithms that make use of everything. Twitter, YouTube, mm -hmm. Instagram, Facebook, everything. And so you kind of have to learn them individually and there are tutorials on them themselves, especially YouTube, where people can kind of give you a deep dive and share little tricks and updates to the algorithms uh, when they happen. So you're prepared and you're making the best move as you're building content. And so the key thing, like I said, is to build content, be consistent and uh, make sure that you're ticking off all the boxes that you need to, to optimize uh, your chances for success on each of these, um, on each of these platforms. But aside from that and being consistent with that, and again, preparing for where the luck comes, you actually have to make sure that the content is good. And there are several kinds of content. You want to make sure you're catering to the audience that you're building, as well as you want to have the type of content that's designed to bring in new audiences. So if that means you're creating interesting fan art, or you know, having a little spin on fan art that wouldn't necessarily be traditional. Maybe you're drawing, you're not just drawing your favorite anime character, you're drawing your favorite anime character. If they had a baby with another anime character and what would that look like? Something interesting that you feel at least you would wanna see, but definitely the masses would wanna see. And then you wanna have content that is you know, building on the ones that you're keeping. Have content to bring them to the table and have content to keep them at the table. And uh, you want to understand how those, uh, so the, how the individual social medias out there work because they work differently. You want to make sure you're, you're making the right moves. To, to that point, when you started and when, when we started, DeviantArt was like the thing. Instagram has obviously taken its place since then. What, what, what would you rank right now for these up and coming creators? What would you rank as being some of the best social media to use to get your name, to get your, your uh, artwork out there? Like if you had to rank like the top three. Top three, number one, I think is still YouTube. Um, number, one, number one is still YouTube. It's, it, as the days go by, it's getting more and more difficult, but you can get lucky. So uh, number one for me is YouTube. Uh, two, is Insta two is Instagram. Um, especially if you're more visual, it just makes sense. And you, Instagram is still adding things to it that kind of welcome video content and, you know, even the TikTok type of content, which leads me to my third, which is a toss, is, is a toss, but I would go TikTok. Instagram, Facebook are kind of connected, so I'll just leave that. I would pick Instagram anyways, but I guess you can have a Facebook, but it's mostly Instagram. So a third, I'll go for TikTok because it's new. And uh, it's actually, you know, at least based off of what I've seen with it, it's easier to, to grow there because it's new. So you have a strong chance. So it could drop from that third spot over time. But as, as for, especially for art, it's, it, you have to find like an interesting way to put that in there. But art videos do do well if you do them right in the, in the TikTok way. You look at other, on all these platforms, you look at what works and then see what you can see how you can do those with your little with your unique original spin to it and try to make it interesting so that's how i'd rank it youtube instagram okay. and tiktok okay and then and then just from, from the standpoint of an artist who you know wants to get their stuff out there if they you know i mean like do you do you find uh, obviously you know you with us but like you've done commissions you've done projects for people who, who've uh you know, been able to uh, offer you, uh, you know, commission rates and so forth to do things. Do you find social media aids in that? Definitely. It's part of putting yourself out there and opportunities would kind of, you still have to hustle and find, go out there and chase opportunities at, at times. But 
as long as you're making good content and you're consistent, you're putting it yourself out there, a lot of opportunities will start to come to you. And some of those would include uh, commissions. And some of those commissions are basically ads to get more commissions or ads to just get more people to see your work if you if the commission allows you or the commissioner or whatever allows you to post that kind of stuff. And that kind of adds to your consistency. So as long as you're making good content, work that people want to see, not work that only your mom thinks is good you know so you you have to also i'm working on uh, from the standpoint of your art is good or whatever you do is good because this applies to everything so assuming that's good and if it's not it's something you want to continuously work on and get credible sources to look at it review it tell you what you need to do to improve whether it be writing uh, drawing you know having really having content that people actually want to see having content that you know interests people and draws people in and so yeah once you once you have that and then you have the consistency of putting it out there eventually the algorithm gods will bless you and you'll be in front of the right eyes again preparing yourself for when the luck comes and so when opportunities come all sorts of opportunities could come it's endless and that would um, commissions as part of it. Literally, that's how we met. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, kind of. Commission, yes. <laughs> no, you're right. Not, you're no, right. no, 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 not 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 commissions, but you know what I mean, like right. putting myself, putting yourself out there. That's how no, we met. absolutely. No, hundred percent correct. Hundred percent right. And and uh, one last question uh, before I move on to Jay is. For folks who, you know, look at what you're doing and are impressed and, and are like, man, you know, I like to try something like that. How many hours do you think you put into this? I know you have talked about this over the years about, you know, when you kind of, when you couldn't put as much time because you were in school, but but what, what what do you, like, what's the rule of thumb for how much time you should put into social media to, to grow a, a brand? I would say uh, overall, it's kind of, depends on you, depends on your situation, but uh, a good stand, because there are going to be a lot, there's going to be a lot of, ups and downs there are going to be a lot of moments that don't feel rewarding you're going to feel there are moments that will feel lonely even um oh. and so it will be a struggle unless you're like super lucky um oh. i would say if you are good if you've gotten to that point where you're undoubtedly good like really we're, yeah. that part that part is established i give oh. and you and and you're being consistent consistently putting out good content i would give it about it's anywhere from three to 10 years. Well, well, we, okay, so actually, let me correct it because I thought I was, I was about to think you were going with that. No, I meant hours per week. I just meant hours per week. Because to your point, if you're not consistent, you're not going to grow it anyway. So, yeah, hours yeah. per week to kind of get it. What, what, what's your recommendation on that? Oof. Uh, I don't know. It's weird, to, it, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's weird to put a number on it. Um, just anywhere from five to 10. Anywhere from five to ten, you definitely want to have your moments in between that you 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 have like a schedule for breaks, a schedule to go exercise, so you're not sitting at, sitting all day, which can affect your health. You know, you you have to put your uh, health forward. But I say like nothing less than five hours a day on average, on average. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, let's move to. Mr. Jay Oden now. Jay's unmuting his mic. He's uh, looking at the camera. Can't hear you, Jay. Can't hear you. Oh, here we go. All right, I hear you now. All right. Okay, now I got now? you. I hear you. Yep, I hear you now. Okay, great. All right, so, Jay, you're the creator of Hammer. Hammer's a fun, quirky series. Why don't you tell everybody about Hammer? Yeah, so uh, first off, uh, I just want to also, you know, thank uh, Wacom for, you know, inviting us on. Uh, you know, this is a dream come true. <laughs> so many awesome things were happening and it's just great. Um, and yeah, this is my series Hammer. Uh, you know, Hammer is about this weird little kid who talks to himself uh, and uh, one day he discovers his father's journal. And uh, inside of this journal, he comes across a passage that uh, references wishing coins. And he didn't know that he was around wishing coins, but he makes a wish to get sucked into this book so that way he can get to know his mom and his dad and in doing so, he gets sucked into this book, and now he's trying to find a way out while uh, looking for his dad, and he's battling all the dangers around him, turning any part of his body into a hammer. Um, you know, there's <laughs> a lot of uh, action that I've been, you know, uh, pumping into the more recent chapters. There have been a lot of action, like, since chapter one, honestly, but 
I'm trying to just make this uh, the most action-packed, fun series like that anybody will ever pick up, hopefully. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, I I, I love drawing the series. This is, this is really really cool. Uh, I've been able to uh, you know draw this as well as also other projects in the past. Um, I just got finished um, with a uh, book that just came out with um, Oni Press. It was called Lemonade Code. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll, get, code, we'll get to that. Uh, we'll get to that. In a, we'll get to that in a sec. Okay. So, so, so on Hammer, uh, your art style is very. Uh, you know, you you know, people look at your art style and they're like, "That's kind of cartoony." It's very Oda-ish, right? But it, but it's also got you know, which Oda stuff is very similar to uh, classic Western artists, as, as all manga. You know, Murata uh, Sensei is into uh, is into uh, American artists and so forth. Uh, all these guys have influences that are great. What what what? Uh, talk to me a little bit about the style that you've employed and what you try to go for with this, and and how that informs the the story that you're telling. I mean, you've had you've done it in color, and the color is really gorgeous. Obviously, we we do more, most of it now in black and white. But talk a little bit about the artistic process you went through. Yeah, so um, the style I've always wanted to have a style that was recognizable, like most shonen jump like titles, uh, and I can draw in pretty much every style, but I went back and forth uh, through, I don't know, maybe three or four past like different drafts of Hammer, trying to lock down the style that I wanted. And I always had a vision of cartoony manga, uh, which is, I guess, a term I'm gonna try to coin. <laughs> but uh, I always wanted to have like cartoony manga, you know, be representative for, you know, Hammer. And, uh, you know, I, you know, it's somewhere on the internet, I'm sure you could find it, but there's a bunch of different drafts. There's actually one inside of the retro pack that we have, and you can see like all the different choices that I made. Um, and originally, I wanted it to be in full color because thinking about it in my head uh, before, you know, I got with Saturday AM, before, you know, this became even more serious, I, you know, wanted it to be kind of like a kid's book that, you know, you would see like a Scholastic, for example, like, you know, those are always in color. Those are always like, you know, on the shelves and stuff. And I, I've always liked manga. I've always wanted to draw my own manga, but I also knew that like, it's, it's you know, really difficult, you know, with, um, you know, the competition, you know, with, uh, you know, Shonen Jump and, you know, all these other uh, companies. So I, uh, I figured at the time, you know, if I keep it in color, that's one thing that can separate it. Um, you know, it already looks cartoony, cartoony manga, you know, I feel like, you know, it, it looks inviting enough for most people to pick up and say, wow, this is cool. But I figured at the time that coloring it would also like draw people to it. So that was the main. That's thing. amazing. That's, that's amazing. That, that was your thought. I, I didn't know that was the, the hook for it. Because I mean, like, yeah, now, that was, just, that think was... About, just, just think nowadays, that would be people with like, that's, that's the way it's done for like, um, uh, like webtoons and stuff. You know, like like that, like the idea that you would upload a webtoon and be black and white is not the norm. So it's interesting. I thought you were just trying to go for like the, like you said, the American comic book style. So I mean, you know, originally I actually was on webtoons, and uh, you know, before uh, White approached me, and you know, we started talking, and you know, Saturday AM became what it is. I, you know, was wanting to like actually grow with webtoons, and then I realized that webtoons is a sea of comic books, and no one's looking at me. <laughs> like I mean, I'm just a fish. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how big I am, I mean, this is a, an infinite ocean. So, like, you know, when I got into Saturday AM, like, I realized that this Saturday AM is, you know, it, it might not be, like, the biggest ocean in the universe, but, like, it's a it's a pond that everybody is going to look at. No, <laughs> like, this is something that everybody comes around the world to look at. And I figured, you know what, I'm a big enough fish to, you know, be standing out inside of this pond. So, like, I, 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 I switched up, and with uh, my thought process of, like, the color aspect, I, I, I knew that that would make me uh, stick out a little bit more. So, uh, but anyway, like I said, recently I've been changing my mindset to make it look more like manga, not only because, you know, that's my original love. <laughs> like, I mean, I love the way a manga looks, you know, it's toned, uh, you know, just so much action and like, you know, there's so many things that you can do. And, um, you know, it's also substantially faster for me. I mean, you know, I'm a fast artist, but I mean, it is so much faster to draw something in black and white and tone it as opposed to coloring it too. So yeah. Well, well you 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 you've you've done the magic of giving me a uh, ability to transition to now talk about Lemonade Code. So you are one of our fastest artists. Uh, people don't know that obviously Hammer is one of the most popular series, but you have done a lot of stuff, as we said earlier. So you've worked for USA Today, which is a major newspaper here in the United States. 
Uh, you've worked for Antarctic Press. You've worked for Oni Press, which is a big publisher. Uh, the most recent uh, project you did with them is called Lemonade Code. It just came out uh, in January or February? It came out in January, December? January 19th. January, yeah, yeah okay. Um, talk a little bit about, so first of all, just number one, I mean, there are a lot of folks who are independent creators and their dream is to work for, you know, one of these big companies. What is that process like? Because you are fast. And that's a massive benefit because obviously big companies have bigger deadlines. What, um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, what it's like uh, to work with a big company in terms of the pressure you feel, the sort of things you got to provide. Like I know in Lemonade Code, you did a number of things. You didn't just draw, you did a number of things. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so uh, in regards to Lemonade Code, the things that I, I did, I, you know, I drew everything and I also colored it. I, uh, you know, luckily there was a, already a letterer who took care of everything and the writer, Jared Pratt, like he took care of all of that. So I was just, uh, you know, the pencil <laughs> for like this book. And I'm really happy that I got to do it because, um, you know, before this book, I wasn't really working on a lot of projects like this. So it was kind of like a training session for me just to like get out of my comfort zone. But while working on this, I was working on Hammer and I also had a, you know, a full-time job. So, you know, a, a lot of time management you know, had to come into play. And, uh, you know, it's very difficult, you know, because, you know, it, it takes a lot of discipline to know, hey, you know, I want to work on this, but I need to work on this. <laughs> and then you got to, you know, know exactly what deadlines are, like exactly like what, you know, Fred was saying earlier. Um, you know, when it came to Lemonade Code, uh, luckily, it was very, like, loose in terms of the deadlines. I had gotten the script and they knew that I had a full-time job and, you know, uh, you know, spoiler alert for everybody that wants to be a comic book artist, you don't see a lot of money for a very long time. Oh, yeah, we're, so we're, gotta, we're, we're gonna get to that, don't worry. We're gonna talk about that, but go ahead. You definitely gotta like, you know, uh, try as hard as you can while also doing, you know, your job. And, you know, if that's mm -hmm. what you were hired to do, draw this book, you gotta give it your all. So, I mean, luckily they worked with me. They knew that my schedule was gonna be what it was. And uh, I was able to um, schedule time off uh, with my schedule at work to be off every uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And those three days, I would, you know, just be with nothing except drawing, you know, Lemonade Code. And, you know, maybe one day would be dedicated to Hammer. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's just a lot of, like, writing things down, knowing exactly how much time you have. Uh, you know, a lot of late nights or a lot of early mornings. It kind of just depends on what you want to do. But um, ultimately, uh, in terms of getting with other companies as well, yeah, you got to put yourself out there. Uh, like White was saying, um, social media is definitely... Uh, you know, uh, a, a game changer, obviously. <laughs> uh, however, um, you know, unfortunately for me, I don't necessarily have as much free time, you know, as, you know, other people, you know, so you got to like figure out exactly what works best for the time that you have. You got to like, you know, focus on this, like, okay, right now, currently I'm, I'm trying to get ahead in a lot of other projects. So that way when other projects come that are already in the works, I'll be ahead enough to be able to work on things and still not have to stress so I've unfortunately put social media to the side, which is not something that I want to do. <laughs> but in, like I said, it, it really dictates like how much time you have. So uh, it really is a lot of discipline, um, but it is very rewarding when you know exactly what you want to do and you go out there and try to accomplish it. So I'm, I'm happy that I was able to work with these companies and, uh, you know, yeah. Do you find, just last question, do you find any tools that help you organize better? Because obviously, as you indicated, you were doing Hammer, you eliminate code, you occasionally you get a commission in. So how do you kind of want to ask White about how many hours do you recommend for like social media? What's your kind of like process and what tools aid you in being able to have a, a schedule that's going to work? Like I, I take it you, you know, you obviously have a home office. Like what, what, talk to me a little about the, the process, the tools you use to make sure you can hit those deadlines. Yeah, so, uh, well, first and foremost, Google Calendar is amazing for all the meetings. Yes, it <laughs> I, is. I recommend having Google Calendar. Uh, also, we would make half the meetings. We would, we would be on this call without Google Calendar. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, you know, I also use my um, alarm and my phone. You know, this, uh, you know, game changer, obviously. Like, just, you know, I just say, hey, Siri, you know, do this. And she's turning on now. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's another tool. Another thing, you know, when it comes to social media in particular, Scheduling out tweets, uh, you can use Buffer. Um, you know, Twitter in and of itself has a scheduler, which I love yeah. actually even more so than Buffer. You can schedule like an entire month and you don't have to pay for anything either. So, I mean, you know, that's that's also really, really cool. Um, 
you know, uh, there are a lot of different uh, social media social media schedulers out there, like Hootsuite. Um, uh, you know, I'm blanking right now, but <laughs> I know that if you use those, they help out a lot. Um, you know, I have sticky notes. Uh, I place them all around <laughs> my office and inside of my, uh, you know, right in front of my screen. So, I mean, it's just a lot of, you know, just writing things down and trying to make sure that you know what needs to be done so that way you can plan enough time to get it done. So, yeah. So it sounds like with both of you, before we move on, I guess, just uh, bring your wife back in for a second. It sounds like with both of you, you know, obviously, you know, Dave's been doing this for a while. White's been doing this for a while now. I mean, both of you guys are, are young, but you've been doing this for a while. So, like, it sounds like not none of neither of you would say that all, if someone asked what you do, you would not say I make comics because you guys do so much more than make comics. You guys are doing social media. You're doing yeah. comics. You're doing. I mean, like, right? Like, I mean, it's not. Is it? Do you think that's the norm now for creators that they're they're you're actually having to be people who multitask? Uh, I think obviously for some it depends on the person. You know, it depends on what they do. Primarily, it depends on what thing they do brings in the most bread or takes the most of right. their time. Uh, right. But for me, I usually if that question ever comes up, I just content creator just that it, crazy, that's kind of like general I make animation I, I make comics i make videos videos are you know it's all kind of content so i you can say online content creator or just in general content creator just because that's all, all we're doing is creating stuff and so we're creators entrepreneurs whatever but yeah i, I understand what you mean and sometimes yeah. uh, especially if you're trying to break in um and i advise early uh it when you're when you're doing all those things well sometimes when you're trying to break in you have to do all those things and if you if you are doing all those things it's difficult to just say oh i make comics because it's much more than that you you, you make comics you're doing you're doing marketing you're doing <laughs> you're yeah, doing everything that's right. That's you wear right. several hats uh but i usually um when i'm talking to a random person i always i i usually say comic book artist just because it's it's still out there. Like, there's not that many comic book artists that are just out there that, you know, that you would meet. And, you know, I'm a pharmacy tech, you know, by day, but comic book artist by night. So <laughs> I get to, you know, talk to all of the, uh, you know, uh, customers that will come talk to me. And, yeah, I do, you know, everything else. And I'll show them the videos. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I wish that, you know, in the future I can make more content. And hopefully I can get to a point where, you know, I'm actually just like, you know, left and right dropping videos and more in illustrations and comic books and everything else but currently right now um you know i would say just comic book artists for me just because you know i love comic books and you know uh it's always interesting <laughs> ultimately I yeah care I, about, uh, uh, sorry go ahead Brent. no no go ahead no you go ahead i would say ultimately the label doesn't doesn't matter depending on who i'm talking to i'm something <laughs> yeah no no I, I totally agree with that I, I think the reason i want to ask the question the reason I, I think both of you really hit on it which is just that you know now and that you know i've said this before but like you know you know i obviously i'm, I'm a lot older and, and like you know when i grew up with comics you know it's just such a different it's such it's so different nowadays like it's number one it's so much easier right but at the same time i think what you two really illustrate is that while it's so much easier to be seen and to get your work out there, it is so much harder because you're now having to do so many more things just to just to get that visibility. And so, like you know, when I was I've talked about this when I was a kid, you know, to get to to, to get into the comic industry, you had to come up with an idea, of course, get someone to draw the idea. You may have to pay them and you know money or pizza or hugs or whatever it is you could give them. Then they would produce the content. Then you had to go somewhere to print it. You couldn't give them anything. Uh, you couldn't give them a hug or a, or a handshake. You had to give them money. So you had to print the comic book, 50 copies, 100 copies, whatever. That's hard money. Once you got it, you can't just sling it to people. Back then, before the internet really became uh, flexible, you actually had to go to your local convention. Some people didn't live near a convention. Obviously, we talk about other countries. Some countries didn't even have conventions. So it was really difficult to get your work out there. And if you did go to a convention, you had to, you had to go through word of mouth. You had to hold on to your copies and really carefully give them away because you know every copy was money and so you wanted to make sure that you give giving to somebody who actually had a contact at marvel or dc or uh you know some of the smaller companies at the time like eclipse or kamiko or, or or something like or malibu so 
the, the point is that now it's it's different, right? It's easier, but it's different, and and it's harder in some ways because you truly are a, a a needle in a haystack, and trying to get visibility means you have to really be proficient in a number of things. It sounds like. Um, okay, so. We'll come at some stuff with that. I think we're making a good time. We're going to have some questions here shortly. Uh, folks, you know, uh, I've got two series uh, that I do, uh, and there's, you know, we're timed directly into the whole process of diversity. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I'm going to keep it real simple. You know, um, again, Saturday AM, as, as you saw with White and, and Jay, what I love about the series that they do, and many of our creators do, is that these are two people of color who, who prove that you don't have to be from Japan to create really awesome content with characters who would you know easily fit into a manga. Uh, both their series have tons of diverse characters, and again, that's something that we want to see more manga do. But they do it. They've got you know create, you know incredible worlds, lots of characters, characters that wear hijabs, characters that have you know different cultural influences and so forth in there. But when you look at their work initially, you would easily think it's from a top artist in Japan, and it's not. It's from a Nigerian uh, kid and from a, a young American, uh, respectively. And so. You know, uh, for the titles that I have, you know, we try to strike a similar tone, except we do have some some diverse characters in this. We have Massy Multiplayer World of Ghosts, which is kind of like Yu-Gi-Oh! It's a young kid who can summon ghosts that can fight uh, amongst other people with ghosts. Uh, he's what they call a player. Uh, the ghosts, of course, are what he summons. And so uh, it's a very popular series. It actually has an artist uh, who uh, has Chinese heritage who's actually based in New Zealand. And so incredibly talented young man named uh, Oscar Fong. So we could not be uh, happier with the response this uh, series has gotten. It's, it's one of the first series we had at Saturday AM, and it now has a toy, and it's been featured in some games just like uh, Apple Black uh, has, and Hammer's been featured in a few things. So we're really excited uh, with this. And then conversely, one of our biggest series uh, is called Clock Striker. Uh, so it's Shonen Manga's first black female lead character. In fact, Imwa, which we just talked about, was Shonen Manga's first Indian lead character. Uh, we, we have not found any uh, major series with an Indian lead character in it like MWOG, and certainly not a, a manga with, a, uh, with the lead character being a young Black female. So we're extremely honored with Clock Striker. It's illustrated by an incredibly talented uh, French artist who, who's originally from Niger, or Niger, and uh, named Asaka Galadima. And uh, it's really fantastic uh, stuff it's about a young girl who wants to be what they call a smith in her world. Think of it like, you know, a Jedi. So there are people who are really smart, they can build things, they can create things, but they can also kick a lot of butt. And she wants to be one of those, except, you know, where she comes from and how she looks, uh, you know, she's not really given the benefit of the doubt. And she's fortunate to hook up with one of the only other female Smiths in history named Miss Clock. And Miss Clock takes a uh, cast under her wing. So in the old days of blacksmiths, a blacksmith uh, apprentice was called a striker. And that's where we get the term Clock Striker from. So, uh, so two series, Master Multiplayer, World of Ghosts, and Clock Striker, both of them with really great diverse artists uh, featuring diverse characters and uh, themes that we think are universal, just like Apple Black Hammer and all of our titles. So uh, we certainly hope you guys will check out uh, all of our stuff. In fact, we have a ton of exclusive series. Uh, as White indicated earlier, we've got Picasso. We have uh, Revolver Kiss, which is from an artist out of South Africa. We have Oblivion Root, which is from an artist out of Senegal. We have uh, Orisha, we have Zephyr, which is from an artist out of the Bahamas, Grimheim from a young female artist out of Germany, um, uh, Hinton, an artist out of the UK, Gunhild, an artist out of um, uh, uh, Denmark, Killshot, and Saigami is from an artist out of, of um, Hungary and uh, Crunch Time. There's so many I could pull, but Hungary. Uh, and in crunch time is from an artist out of uh, Cyprus. And we, even, we have even more than that, folks. And so again, we really take seriously the idea of diverse manga, but more importantly, we take seriously the idea of create our own content. So you know, it really matters that Saturday M stands for not just trying to e make equal the playing field of characters and representation in manga, but we also take very seriously the idea that creators uh, should be able to participate in their works. One of the best things about manga is that even though there are characters like Goku and Naruto and and uh, I don't know half these characters, Itadori and so forth, uh, you know, these are characters that uh, uh, still are, are, are owned uh, by the creators and that's what makes the work uh, so incredibly uh, just uh, dynamic and uh, you generate so much respect amongst other creators because we know how hard it is. And so the fact that they've been able to do it 
really reap the rewards from it and still retain ownership of it is something that I think is, uh, you know, more and more American companies starting to do this, but we certainly uh, take our cues from how the Japanese uh, do it uh, for the most part. So again, definitely you can check all of our stuff out in our app. Um, we have, uh, you know, we certainly began the process uh, back in 2013, talking about diverse mega. We were the first group in the marketplace. That's why we're the biggest brand in the space. And, and we continue to grow at it. We've been very honored and very uh, happy to have a number of uh, companies, uh, media interests, uh, large groups like Emmy's Network, Pop Insider, Comic Resources, Sci Fi Wire, The Geekery, Neo Magazine, and more profile and talk uh, about uh, either our creators uh, or our characters or our entire brand and, and mission for Diverse Manga. One of the big things that we do that matters for us is not just representation amongst our creators and amongst our characters, but it's representation amongst continuing to push opportunities for up and coming creators. So we have two ways that we really do it that we are big fans of. Uh, and they're uh, First of all, it's called March Art Madness. And this is something we do every year and it's a really big deal. Um, I'm really, really proud of this. I gotta say, like, it's, it's something that I, I'm so proud of that we do. And it's one of the things that when we talk to other companies, uh, in fact, it's brought us into, uh, into relationships with a lot of big companies around the world. It's, a, it's an art tournament uh, that takes place across five weeks. And we have mano a mano art battle. So think of to yourself, this is a situation where you and other artists are drawing the exact same thing. And so it comes down to the choices you make, the style you use, the, the talent that you have, how clever you are with the tools you may use. Um, and, uh, and you've got 64 participants. So every week that number continues to drop down until it's the final four. And we give away big prizes. We give away professional art contracts. So again, if you're an up and coming artist from a country that maybe is not known for creating manga style art, this is an opportunity for you. And we take very seriously this opportunity for creators to be in a position to be seen. So this is such a big deal for us, such a really, really big deal. Um, we're really excited at this. Uh, the first year we had an American win, the second year we had an artist from Sweden, third year an artist from Australia, fourth year an artist from the UK, and then Alyssa Moore won in 2020. And we just finished 2021 actually, and that artist uh, who won um, was from the Philippines. So uh, we think that having events like this and actually giving artists prizes, recognition for working hard is such an important step to creating, to, to continuing to democratize art and give more artists a chance to succeed. When you're, in a, when you're in a country that maybe doesn't have a big art scene or a big comic scene, it's really hard to get tools to use. And this is an event that helps make that easier. The other thing that we do, of course, is Summer of Manga. That's happening right now, as a matter of fact. The Summer of Manga is an event that we actually do every year where we produce brand new manga every summer for up and coming artists. They, just like any big company, they pitch us their comic book idea. We vet it, uh, myself and some of our editors and some of our creators. We choose some of the best. This year, we've got 20 uh, creators from around the world. In fact, they're from Ghana, Italy, Australia, Lithuania, Trinidad and Tobago the Bahamas, USA, and more. So it's really, really, really extraordinary event. And we see some amazing talent, amazing original properties. And then the readers get to vote. And so what this does, the reason we love this event so much is that first of all, there are a lot of artists out there, again, when we try to talk about diversity and democratization, there are a lot of artists out there who, who fail to, to get the due that is owed to them because they're shy. They don't want to put themselves out there. They don't want to take that sort of, uh, pressure. And, you know, there was a time where I used to be pretty harsh about that because I think that, you know, you can't be in this business if you want to, you know, and, and be anonymous. Like, it's really difficult to do that. But I've become more sympathetic to it because I, I think, uh, you know, we certainly experienced it last year, myself and, and a couple of our, uh, uh, one of our staff members and one of our female artists got some really nasty harassment and abuse from a lot of young artists who had tried to join Saturday AM and had not, hadn't been able to get, make it through. Uh, you know, we had to, you know, consult legal means. We're still in the process of kind of dealing with that. But the fact of the matter is that it really is toxic sometimes on the internet. And we're very um, sympathetic to that. So, so events like Summer Manga are great because what it does first and foremost is that it shows people that there is a community that cares. You have a chance to get real feedback from people, our, fan, our real fans who genuinely want to see 
uh, new ideas, new artists who really want to support creators from different countries. Uh, and so it's such a lovely event. Uh, the comics and the producers are really awesome and they're different. And, and so it's a, so we, we, take, I, we take Summer Manga, March of Madness and just general art outreach very seriously because we believe it's so important to create the diverse manga industry that we want to see to make sure that we provide more opportunities and we provide real safe areas for artists to express themselves. So really key part of what we do. And, uh, you know, Saturday AM speaks to diverse fans of manga and artists. We have so many things that we're doing that we will be doing. We have a video game uh, that features our characters. All of our artists contributed to it. It's called Flick Solitaire. You can download it right now in the App Store for iOS or Android. It's called Flick Solitaire. If you do it, make sure you get the Saturday AM deck and check out all the gorgeous artwork that's there. We had some beautiful toys generated by Jabberwocky Toys. Of some of our series, Apple Black, Bully Eater, and Mass Multiplayer World of Ghosts. Uh, and of course, we have graphic novels. We have a big announcement coming, uh, not, not today, but coming soon regarding the future of our graphic novels. So we're really stoked about the power of the Saturday AM brand, how we continue to push and push and push to bring diverse content uh, out to you guys. Now, we have some big plans in 2021 and beyond. We hope to be everywhere. We want to reach and continue to drive our message to up and coming creators and to fans of manga who want to see more diverse content. We want to do that everywhere we possibly can. And you're going to see us pushing to do more of that. You're going to find us being more active than digital. We've got some new things coming to our app and new things coming to our online events. We have some new manga coming from different countries. We've got one coming from France. We have, uh, we have some new uh, artists, some folks who can blow you away. And as I indicated earlier, we're going to be coming to a store near you, hint, hint. And you may not know what that is, and I can't talk about it yet, but we definitely have ambitions in retail. Now, we're going to get to your questions, but I do want to thank you all for being a part of today's chat. We certainly hope you guys have questions for us. But I do want to tell you that while we wrap this up, this main part of the presentation, I do want to say one thing. We care so much about diverse manga. It's such a part of what we do. We started this whole conversation. People weren't talking about this a lot in 2013 in the early aughts. And we care so much about this that we decided that we wanted to do something special to really provide real logistics, real, real tools, and real information to those creators who want to create their own manga. So, I'm really pleased to announce today in this panel that we are bringing out in 2022, the summer, courtesy of a publishing partner of ours named Quarto Books, a brand new product called How to Draw Diverse Manga. This is gonna be a mass market book that's gonna leverage our entire brand, our characters, our creators, to create an original book for the entire world. This is not for the U.S. market. This is for this. This can be appreciated in Japan, in South Africa, in Australia, in Eastern and Western Europe. It can be appreciated everywhere. But we want to help artists, either existing artists, people who already are in the business, or up and coming artists, to create original, diverse characters. We're going to show you how we've done it. We're gonna give you the entire tool, the entire breakdown. And we are so pleased with this experience. We can't wait to show you guys what this book is gonna have. Now, fortunately, White and uh, Jay are two central parts of the book. And without getting too specifics, obviously, I, I would love to hear from both of them as to what they hope uh, and what they uh, can tell you guys about uh, what they believe this book will be able to do. So I'm gonna start with Jay in this uh, first. Uh, Jay, you actually contributed this giant, um, Afro image at the bottom, which I, I know this is based on a mirror that you looked at one day. Tell everybody uh, what your <laughs> tell everyone about your hopes for how to draw diverse. Saturday and presents how to draw diverse manga. Um, I hope it helps out every artist that wants to be one day in our shoes. Um, you know, hopefully they can also take what we are going to present in this book. And evolve it so that way the next generation can have something else that hopefully will also come from Saturday AM. Hopefully they'll just love it so much and <laughs> they'll want to join us. So I just hope that this will be a nice staple into um, teaching, uh, you know, and developing more diverse artists from around the world. 
Agreed. And what about you, White? Uh, same there. Uh, just echoing what uh, Jay has said, as well as also to have a tutorial book that is not just teaching you one specific way to do things. Like the book's going to have different perspectives on how you can not just learn how to do it in multiple ways, but also inspire you to develop your own style uh, and, and put that together, teach the fun uh, fundamentals and you know, touch spaces that other or most, at least ones that I've heard of, other tutorial books never touch, which is, you know, drawing characters from different ethnicities done by people from different ethnicities and uh, the fresh perspectives that can come from that. So I'm excited for people to see what we've come, uh, come up with. I, I'm not even exaggerating when I say it could be, it has a potential to be the best how to draw a book, period that I've ever, you know, come across. So, yeah, you know, so I'll just tell you guys, we've been working on this for some time. Uh, it's been very eye-opening for me because this is not an area that I've ever, I mean, as a kid, I had a, how to draw books the Marvel Comics way. But uh, it's been really, really rewarding to watch uh, all of our creators, uh, Raymond Brown and, and Morgan Walker and, and uh, J.R. DeBard, J.R. DeBard in particular, uh, Mitch Proctor, and, and just a host of people uh, work on this project alongside of White and Jay, I've been, I've been really um, just blown away by the incredible talent. And, and what I think, what I would say is really two things. One is that if you've ever watched the videos that Jay and, 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 and White have done on, uh, you know, Jay's done more videos, I think, on TikTok, uh, or at least he's, he's put some stuff on TikTok that's been seen pretty well. And then White, of course, is big, you know, everywhere. But if you've seen some of the tutorials that they do, just, just imagine getting like a step-by-step -step process of how these two extraordinary artists create their work and that's what this book is going to do and provide as white said other artists who can give you other perspectives on being able to create you know a variety of things that can help you craft your own diverse manga character as you can see here in this work like there are some characters you're going to never have seen before and and you're going to learn what went into designing these characters really extraordinary cool looking diverse manga style characters the second thing i would say is that something i just mentioned earlier i just want to really reiterate this if you are an artist today, if you are working professionally, I've been to Japan, I've worked with the Japanese, and I can tell you that this has come up repeatedly in conversations I've had with, uh, with, with Japanese uh, companies and with uh, uh, groups who deal with manga style content, that, uh, that, that they are, would love to see a book that truly focused on diverse uh, characters. Because uh, things like drawing hair is really, or drawing, you know, let's say black hair is really difficult. And, and if you look at manga, you'll see that it tends to be something that's not well done. Uh, and so, um, so, you know, we're really excited at the fact that this is not going to just empower and support up and coming artists. But this is going to be a really great, um, to White's point, a really great book for existing artists who are just looking for additional uh, reference and research material to help them continue to grow and, and craft even more uh, accurate representation and, and content. So again, we could not be more honored uh, for this. I want to thank uh, the folks at Quarto Books for believing in us and wanting us to and helping us produce this book. We're still in the process of finishing it up, but this will be coming out in the summer of 2022. This will be a mass market. This will be a book that will be built for everybody, regardless of what country you're in, regardless of your age. This is a completely open book for folks who just love art, love manga style content and want to create their own characters so uh so that is uh all i've got to say on that and uh uh jerome i don't know if you uh, have any questions you want to read to us i think i think that's it for us at least in terms of the core part of the presentation yes one important question most important question when can we order it or pre-order it this book so actually looks amazing this is so cool this is so cool i can't wait to get it in my hands so uh, I actually talked to the company today. Uh, we had a big marketing meeting about this and some other things. And they, uh, they actually said, they were, they were like, like, oh man, like, you know, we wish we could have it available for pre-order. Uh, so unfortunately, you know, it won't be available for pre-order just yet. We're still in the process of wrapping things up with it. But we do suspect that this will be something uh, that will be available for pre-order before the end of the year. And uh, certainly within Q4. And, uh, and there'll be additional material that we'll be able to share because there's some things that obviously we can't talk about yet that I think are going to be, to White's sure. point, uh, very, uh, very unique in the, in the how-draw space. I love it. 
can't wait. It's 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 really cool. Talking about books, um, that's one of uh, the many favorite questions that we get, got through basically all three days of this event is what manga or comic actually inspired both of you or the three of you to go into drawing and art? Who wants to start? You go first, Jay. Um, yeah, uh, what manga book inspired me? Uh, <laughs> manga, I would say Dragon Ball Z, but before that, I knew that I wanted to draw comics. I, um, you know, there's a cartoon that was on Nickelodeon a long, long time ago called Doug, and uh, he, he used to draw comics, and his character was called Quail Man, and I always thought that that was so cool. And I initially wanted to be a superhero, and then I realized, well, there's no reason, there's no way to do that. <laughs> so I was like, all right, well, it looks like I'm drawing, and here I am. So, you know, eventually I got old enough, and I, uh, you know, I, I'd seen Toonami. I think the very first scene I'd ever saw was Vegeta, you know, screaming that he was going to kill Gohan because he took his Dragon Ball. Oh, <laughs> and I was like, I got to find out what's going on. So that that's probably uh, where it all started for me. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Why? Um, for me, kind of like Jay, I've always, I've, I've always loved to draw and I've always kind of had stories in my head that I've felt compelled to tell. Uh, but big starters for me were, uh, Street Fighter video games and just like the art on the cartridges, uh, the Super Nintendo. Um, and then I got into all the Western stuff with the Superman, Spider-Man, X-Men, Batman, all that. Um, and then anime manga came in, Rooney Kenshin. Um, Rooney Kenshin for the most part, but I think when I started to take making comics seriously, the one series that I was, oh, I saw myself going back to that really inspired me to pick up the pen uh, was Bleach. And um, so I was, I was a huge, mm -hmm. still I am a Bleach uh, fan. And, you know, the, 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 big, the big mainstream series, Bleach, Naruto, One Piece, um, Gintama. And recently, you know, you're my heroes and your one punch mans. But I think the one series that got me to pick up the pen, I would say, I would give that to Bleach. Cool. Thanks. Um, maybe a question um, on how you work. So maybe some tips on, on, on world building and how far you actually plan ahead your stories um, and how detailed do you um, build your worlds before actually starting? Uh, I think it depends on how you work. Sometimes it kind of work hand in hand. You might even, even starting with the plan on say creating it, right? Sometimes I would write what's going to happen. Let's say I'll get to the question on how you plan the whole thing or whether mm -hmm. you even plan the whole thing. But when it comes to actually maybe making, say a, just writing a chapter and let's say your chapter is, your chapter could be anywhere from, seven at anywhere from seven pages we kind of have to we, we kind of work differently with sad day but it could be from seven pages and beyond right and you write your story based off of that script you do the storyboards the storyboards are kind of like the blueprints of how the pages are going to be laid out and so you write your script you do the storyboards rough sketches and sometimes while you're storyboarding you might come up with a different idea maybe something doesn't translate as well to the visuals and that kind of goes back and informs the script, so you go change the script. So it's kind of like happening, they're building each other, but it starts with the script, and you go back to the storyboard, you're doing the storyboards, it might actually take you back to the script to tweak things because you have a better idea, and it kind of goes hand in hand until you're done with the storyboards for the chapter. And then you go make it, whether you want to make it traditionally or you want to make it digitally. Depending on how you want to make it, those kind of have their own path that you want to do your research and make sure you know how to execute all of that. So it, it, get, it can get really, really complicated. I use Clipsio Paint to make my pages when I'm working uh, digitally. Recently, I acquired help with uh, manga assistance to help with uh, the inking here and there, and I'm still forming ways to even become more and more efficient so I can put out more and more content and be consistent like we discussed. If you're working traditionally, you get your paper, maybe the leader paper, comic book, the leader paper, you sketch the, paper, uh, sketch the page, you then ink it with maybe Sakura pens uh, and then, or G pens, depending on how you want to ink. It also depends on style. Style is not just how you draw, how you draw eyes or nose. It's literally how you do everything, how you produce anything, how you, how you, how you work. And so you can go down that path. And even when I used to do that, you can either screen tone traditionally 
or color traditionally, maybe with Copics, Copics, however it's pronounced, or you scan it in uh, and work on it digitally with software like uh, Clip Studio Paint or Photoshop or whatever works for you. And then there are other people who, you know, do Webtoons. And so it, it depends on how you want to work. With regards to the stories, um, is it just like the script and the storyboard, it kind of go hand in hand. Sometimes there are people who start with your uh, coming up with characters first, and then there's people that start with uh, the story or they start with like building the world first. And overall, you're kind of just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until you form something strong enough to start. And you only know it's strong enough if the feedback you've gotten from credible sources are positive and you're just kind of going back and forth. Uh, this is how, how you come up with the storyboard, again, is part of you know, making use of uh, social media and online resources. Sometimes you, you could get some of this information if you go to college, but you can find some of it online. And like I said, my YouTube channel literally has videos that tackle, I think two videos that actually tackle world building specifically and a host of other things that I imagine you would need, you can find online, but so videos on storyboarding, how to write storytelling is one thing to have an idea is another thing to be an actual storyteller. A lot of people have ideas, but mm -hmm. they don't really, they don't really know how to tell the story. A lot of people think they're writers, but they've not really written anything. I'm sure Fred would have a lot to say about that. Uh, where you know, <laughs> there are people who think they're writers, and, but really maybe they just have an idea. I mean, the idea is, is still the jury's like, it's not even sure whether the idea is great or not yet, but all you have is an idea so far. You're not really a writer if you've not really written anything. So there are a host of things to consider. Like the question is very, very broad, but bottom line is a lot of the stuff you can find online or you can, you know, like I said, I've made uh, several videos tackling them um, head on with my story whether i have the whole thing planned out again it kind of goes back i could have the whole thing planned out today but tomorrow i change my mind on another thing or another thing so i have a, a a decent idea when it comes to like key details key events that i know must happen or should happen still subject to change and still loose enough to where i can make interesting changes or tweak certain things here and there but i, I have a general idea of where I'm headed with the story, but still open to open to some change here and there. It kind of is, again, it's up to you. You can have the whole thing planned out or you can have, you can be planning it out as it goes on, depending on whether your story is episodic or not. But uh, it kind of, it kind of, it kind of depends on you. But for me, I have, I have a decent idea of where I'm heading with the story right. and it's open to changes here and there. And I just build from that. Great. I have a thought. I mean, I have a point I want to make on that. But let me let me give Jay. Jay's got anything more to add to that. Did you want to add anything to that, Jay? Yeah. Um. I mean, just piggybacking off of you know what White said. Uh, when it came to me, uh, you know, planning out everything, um, I already kind of knew generally what I wanted to happen. Uh, the advice that I would give to anybody that wants to write out their story is know what the ending is, so that way you can have, you know, your character go towards that ending and you know everything else in between is you know just kind of fluff that you know makes it cool um but i mean i, I knew what the ending was going to be uh you know I, I i sat down i wrote out like you know general plot points and then after that i expanded on every plot point so now i have several different notebooks that you know kind of outline all of hammer <clears throat> uh you know that's <laughs> that's just the way i wrote this particular story there are different stories that I've written that um, are definitely more episodic where you can, um, you know, they can change. And I know basically the setup of the world and, you know, how to do everything. But in regards to uh, planning out your story and like doing everything and, you know, world building and all of that, I would really just sit down and, you know, write out ideas, brainstorm, um, you know, exactly what I was saying. Uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot of different things that go into it. Uh, you just got to see what your best process is. Um, but brainstorming and writing everything down is probably the best thing I would say. But uh, yeah, that uh, there you go. Just to piggyback yeah. on what you what you just said with the planning again, on knowing your ending. At, at, at least for me, it doesn't have to be again 100% defined. Like I said, I'm open open to some change. But it's always good to have a decent idea of where you're headed. That way, you can it, it kind of helps your writing in the now, and you can kind of foreshadow certain things here and there, and 
it makes your world interesting. You can plan out mysteries and things like uh, things of that nature much easier if you have at least some idea. But I always still recommend, you know, some open to change, but ultimately it depends on you. Yeah, so, so let me let me answer. Let me let me let me bail on that. But let me get provide a slightly different perspective for folks because I, I you know as I tell these guys all the time, like you know, there's a there are two things I really try to impress upon our, our folks at Saturday AM. One is uh, to be a student. Uh, of the industry, uh, you know, I think it's great to be a fanboy or a fan girl of, of comics and manga. All of us are, or we wouldn't be doing this. You, you have to, you know, obviously, if you're not a fan of the stuff. You don't want to do this stuff. Uh, you don't want to do it as badly. Plus, as Jay mentioned before, there's not a lot of money in this. In some phases, I think everyone who's at this Wacom event knows there's not a lot of money in comics uh, at a certain level. Obviously, that changes as you get more successful. But here, here's what I'll say from a business standpoint. I hope everyone keeps this in mind. You can have all the ideas and plans you want. At the end of the day, if you actually start getting to a point where you're making money, you must be, as White indicated, you must be flexible. You must be understanding the tenor of the business. The business is the business. The business does not care what you look like. It does not care, you know, how awesome you think your idea is. I tell people all the time, you know, when you say I've got a great idea and so forth, well, your, your mother may think so, your dad may think so, but it's different when a consumer has to choose if they're going to buy some food, buy a snack, subscribe to Disney Plus or Spotify, or to support their favorite artist. But that's a difference because that's a choice that they make. And it's a choice that means they're giving up something for you. There's no greater level of fandom than that. I think too many folks on, on, on uh, social media, young artists, they get confused. They think, oh man, this thing has so many likes on Instagram. Uh, White and Jay, they'll tell you the first thing I told them, no one pays you for them likes. Like you're not getting, it'd be something different if you're getting 25 cents every time somebody liked your post. You don't make money on those likes. So as a creator, I think every creator has to be a student of the business. If things are work, if you see the industry changing a certain degree, then it's not that you have to change what you're doing, but you certainly should be responsive to where the market is. You certainly should be aware of what interest is. If if, 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 if we talk about manga, if you look at the Shonen Jump model, if you look at a lot of uh, the popular manga that comes out of Japan, one of the things about being in, in the anthology format, in the magazine style format, I've got one here, but I can't pull it up. But one of the, here we go. <laughs> this is a magazine we'll be coming out with something called Super Saturday. But one of the things about being in a, in, a, in, a, in a format like this with lots of stories is that you've got to perform. Because if people aren't talking about you, if they don't care, there's always so much space here. They're gonna, we, the publisher is gonna find someone else to put in that spot. Think of it like a store. If you go into a store and you really like ice cream sandwiches, but they have stock a lot of nutty buddies and you're always like, man, why aren't there more ice cream sandwiches? It's because there are not a lot of people like you who like ice cream sandwiches, that's why. The store is gonna stock what sells. So as a creator, I think you have to always be conscious of what it is you want to do compared to what the industry is saying works. Does it mean you have to change what you stand for? Does it mean that, you know, that, 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 that what you believe in or what you want to do is necessarily wrong? But folks, you may not get a volume two, a volume three, an issue two, an issue three, if the first material doesn't actually work. If it's not connected with an audience, then in capitalism, you're not going to get that second or third attempt. So you've got to be cognizant. That's why, as White said earlier, you know, always have an idea of where your story is going because you can't build effective stories without that. At the same time, be flexible enough to understand that, you know what, at the end of the day, you want to make sure you're telling an entertaining story that people want to read. So therefore, always leave yourself room to tweak things and change things and add perspective and add new characters or, or maybe put this character in a different situation that can add to the drama, add to the thrills that will make people want to continue to support your work. Because at the end of the day, folks, this is a really hard business. So if you can't amass an audience who likes what you're doing, it's really hard to make money at it. So the first rule of thumb is to be true to yourself, but to also entertain. You're not creating an autobiography and you're a ninja in, in, in some part, some futuristic version of Japan. That's not your autobiography. So, you know, you're entertaining, entertain people. That's the job. Hope that helps. And that, <laughs> that is, I think, a perfect ending to this session. It was absolutely entertaining. It was That's absolutely awesome. entertaining. And um, 
as as Jaredin already mentioned, um, have a clear idea of the ending. Well, we tried. We never thought that uh, this three day event would take us into this position, but <laughs> we we are amazed. We are thrilled that we had you here on the show. So so thank you so much, guys, for this amazing session. You shared so many important and really valuable insights. Um, it was absolutely inspiring and and fascinating to to listen to you and to see your artwork. Um, and as we've seen in the chat, people people just loved it. Um, so yeah, to all of you out there, if you want to see what Saturday AM is up to next, do find and follow all of them on their respective social media accounts. I personally cannot wait to see that book coming up next year. I think that's that's just brilliant. Well, that was it for this session. And that was it for this year's manga and anime days. Uh, I can't believe that it's already the last session. Um, and these three days full of manga just flew by. A massive, massive thank you to all the art artists and partners that joined us in those 10 sessions over the last days. Uh, thank you also to Sarah Jean, Onur, Gerardo, and Christy, and the entire team behind the scenes here at Wacom and at Pixiv and Clip Studio Paint, Joanna, for making this possible. Um, but the biggest yes. thank you, of course, goes out to all of you out there who joined us and made these three days so special for all of us. I'm sure we will be back sometime, but for now, bye-bye and good night. Until then, thank you very much. Thank you so Take much. Care, guys. <laughs>